Hi everyone, my name's Michelle Quick. I am um, a doctor at IVF Australia, based mostly at Greenwich on Sydney's North Shore. Um, also clinical director at the IVF Australia unit um, in DY on Sydney's beautiful northern beaches. Um, and also um, a, um, a, a day a week in the city um, near Wynyard Station. Um, in York Street there. So I'm going to be here for 30 minutes. Hi, Amy. I'm going to be here for 30 minutes um, talking to myself or answering any questions that people may have, um, but anything fertility related or um, related to any treatment that you're currently undergoing. Um, so feel free to drop a comment in and um, I'll see. And um, hi, Violet. Hi, Rainbow and um, hopefully I'll get to all of the questions um, within the 30 minutes. Um, we're all very happy to be back um, doing IVF again after the government closed down elective surgery because they decided that IVF was an elective procedure. Um, so back to doing the um, IVF um, egg collections again this week. So we're all really happy about getting back to helping people make families. Um, so Camilla, um, can you talk me through the hyperstimulation phase of IVF? Um, so with IVF, what happens is um, every month at the start, we're basically taking advantage of the woman's natural cycle. Yeah. So every month at the beginning part of the cycle, there's normally a bunch of eggs that sit in the ovaries. And the woman, because we're human, we're only meant to have one baby at a time. So every month our hormones go a certain level. So from that bunch of eggs, we'll choose one of those eggs to grow. That's the one that you release um, and it's ovulated. The remaining eggs that are there for that month, they die for the month. Yeah, and this is how we finish all our eggs by the time we're 50. So every month we're like wasting eggs. So when you do IVF, what you're trying to do is supplement the natural hormones so that instead of the woman just choosing one egg to grow that month, that's how we can get six or seven or nine or ten eggs to grow. Um, and that's what those injections are for, to supplement the hormones. So then if you were to take out those eggs to try with with an IVF cycle, you would then lose fewer eggs that month than if the woman just ovulated one and the rest died. Yeah. So doing IVF, we know it doesn't speed up people's menopause. It doesn't use the eggs up any quicker than normal. Every month you've got those eggs already there. And if you don't take them, they're going to go anyway. Yeah. So that's what happens when you're stimulating during IVF. What hyperstimulation is, is where you overdo the response, um, either with a dose that's too high, usually with a dose that's too high. Um, and if you get more than 18, 19, 20 eggs growing, um, then that results in the ovaries being physically very big and the woman gets quite uncomfortable um, and can get quite sick from that process, which is why the IVF um, cycle during this, the injection phase will be doing blood tests and ultrasounds. Usually you'll have to come to the clinic maybe two or uh, three times, three, four times, just so we can keep an eye on how the hormones are going and make sure that we're not over overdoing things. So you might see doctors dropping the dose of the medication down, try and prevent the, the hyperstimulation side of things so patients don't get unwell um, from doing IVF. So I hope that answered your question, Camilla. Um, Violet has a question here wanting to ask about exercise. Um, I usually don't tell my patients to stop exercise. I actually think exercise is a very good way of moder um, of using up sort of energy and trying to deal with anxiety because doing IVF, the whole process, it's quite um, difficult emotionally to deal with and exercise can sometimes be quite a good outlet for stress. What I'll often tell my patients though is to drop the intensity of your exercise. So rather than stop everything, still keep doing things, but just not as hard as you were doing. So you might not want to do hit classes, you might not want to um, do spin classes. Um, you can still do exercise, but just not as intense as what you were doing. Um, uh, and then this, it will be, are we moderating exercise? or restricting exercise from the transfer to the end of first trimester, um, yes, I'd say um, that's, the, that's the period where you want to just drop the intensity down. Hey, Lise. Um, Rainbow, after egg pickup, how long to wait for the PGS results? So with the egg collection, um, we then have to put the eggs and sperm together to create the embryos. And we would grow the embryos for five days, right? Because what we're going to find, depending on the woman's age, um, some of the eggs that we collect they're not good some eggs and sperm don't meet properly some embryos they stop growing along the way and so what we what ends up happening is you might end up with you might start with a bunch of eggs but then as you grow the embryos along for five days you end up weeding out the ones that aren't going to make you pregnant so after five days 
rather than having the same number of eggs that you started off with, there might be one or two or three nice embryos, but they're your chances of getting pregnant. So they're the ones that you want to screen. Yeah. Um, and the screening results for uh, this is screening looking for chromosome issues um, in the embryo. Uh, Down syndrome, whether the embryo is missing a particular chromosome, meaning it's not going to give you a, a healthy child. Um, and that kind of screening, it can it usually takes about 10 working days to get a result back from that point on. Yeah. So once you've found your embryos after five days, you're going to test the embryos. You then have to freeze the embryos so that you can wait for a result back. So you're actually getting pregnant the following cycle rather than on that cycle where you've done the egg collection. Uh, Christina, I have poor egg quality and PCOS. How can I help improve egg quality during IVF? Um, I mean, that's that's a um, very good question. Um, I think around the world, people, people, fertility um, doctors have have two main issues that are um, the same all around the world. One is if someone's used up all their eggs or has has a low egg reserve, how do we increase that again? Um, the other one is if people have, if women have a low egg reserve, how do we improve the quality of the eggs that are there? And I think that's a very difficult one. People have looked at all sorts of things. They've looked at aspirin, they've looked at steroid, all sorts of things, and no one's really conclusively come up with an answer, which is the difficulty. Um, recently, studies have come out looking at antioxidants, um, so CoQ10. Um, so CO, capital Q, and the number 10. Um, and that's an antioxidant that you can get just over the counter at the health food stores. Um, they come in different strengths. Um, so you want to get the um, 150 milligram uh, tablets or capsules, and you want to take three of them a day. So the dose for women, what the studies have looked at in terms of trying to improve egg quality, the dose there is 450 milligrams a day. Um, so doing that may help. There are some studies as well looking at melatonin which most of you will know as the medication that, or the, the tablet that people take to try and um, stop jet lag. So melatonin is also an antioxidant, so that's how we think it works. Um, and the studies have mostly looked at a dose of four milligrams that you take at night. It does make people drowsy, that's how it works to stop jet lag, so you want to take it at night. Um, in terms of side effects, the CoQ10 doesn't really have side effects. Um, it's an antioxidant, it's probably quite good for you, general, general health anyway. Uh, melatonin though some girls can get really bad dreams with melatonin so I think the studies aren't strong enough to say that you have to persist with it um, if you don't if you're not tolerating it but it may be something that's worth a try as well um, with your melatonin um, so there are a couple of things that people can do to try and improve egg quality um, during IVF there um, Cassie uh, is it normal to have an extended period after a cancelled cycle due to the follicles not being big enough um, so if the follicles aren't big enough and the cycle gets cancelled, so when we do all the blood tests and ultrasounds, we want the follicles to be a certain size before we go to take the eggs out, because otherwise you run the risk that the eggs that you're going to find are going to be immature and you can't fertilize immature eggs. Um, you can't get pregnant with those. So if the follicles aren't big enough, then often we, we don't, uh, we have to wait for them to get bigger. Um, so if you've had your cycle cancelled because the follicles aren't big enough though, um, and you haven't actually released any eggs, then yes, your period can take a long, longer time um, before it starts up again. Uh, Cassandra, for a single woman in her early 30s with no fertility issues, what method would you normally suggest? Um, okay, so in terms of trying to conceive, um, there are two ways to conceive. Um, one way is relatively simple and easy, right, which is um, insemination. So what we do there is we do blood tests and ultrasounds on the woman um, because what we're trying to work out is when she's going to ovulate for the month, yep. Yeah? And then once we've um, worked out that she's going to ovulate, then we put the sperm up inside the uterus um, so it's at the right time of the month. So that's called insemination. It doesn't hurt. It's like having a pap smear done. And that's the simplest easiest most natural way to try and get pregnant okay um the other way to get pregnant is with ivf which i've already kind of gone through so that's injections to try and get multiple eggs to grow we then have to take the eggs out which is like a 20 minute procedure um you have some sedations you don't feel what we're doing and from the vagina we take the eggs out so there's no cuts in your tummy you're home that day most people are back to work the next day so it's quite a minor procedure really but then the eggs and sperm have to be put together outside in the lab and that creates embryos and we then grow the embryos for five days um, so that we can exclude the ones that aren't going to make us pregnant 
um, the embryos that aren't any good. So at the end of the five days from a bunch of eggs, you'll have a few embryos and then we, we can put an embryo back into the uterus. Which again, it's like having a pap smear done, so it's not an awful procedure um, to have a transfer. Um, if someone's young with no fertility issues um, and we've done all the checks, you know, to make sure that we've got a good ovarian reserve, that the fallopian tubes are working, then often insemination is a good option because it's the simplest, easiest, most natural way to try and get pregnant. Yeah. Um, so I think that um, if you've got no fertility issues, often we will go that way um, just because it is simpler and less invasive for the woman. Yep. Um, Christina, I have a great fertilization rate and lots of eggs, but they all die by day five. Oh. Um, okay. So in terms of the, it's hard to know. I think you really need to have a look at what the um, scientists are recording on your embryology sheet. So with um, embryo growth, the first three days of embryo growth is very much, the energy of the embryo very much comes from the egg. Yeah, so it's derived from the egg. The sperm kind of kicks in from about day four onwards. So it depends on where your embryos, when your embryos are stopping. Um, often if there's an egg quality issue, we'll find that the, um, you know, eggs may not fertilize properly um, and they're really slow to grow right from the beginning. So right from day one, day two, they're starting to be to, to, to be slow, right? Because we know that on day two of development, embryo development, we would expect to see between um, two to four cells within the embryo. On day three, you'd expect six to eight cells in the embryo. So if we're already slow by that point, so on day three, say you've only got two cells or four cells, three cells, then you're worried there's an egg issue. Whereas if everything looks really good until day three and then they kind of stop, then you you might need to look into the sperm um, and whether there's any issues with the sperm. So probably best to have, maybe chat to your fertility specialist about that. Okay. Um, Liz, is royal jelly still good to take before I do a frozen transfer? I think um, with a lot of these things, the evidence is not conclusive, yeah? Um, I think that if the studies show there's no harm, there's probably, you know, if you want to try, you can try. But I think there's no studies out there that, show, that say that women have to take royal jelly um, or CoQ10 or melatonin or any of those things because um, uh, if you don't do it, it's not going to work. Do you know what I mean? So I think as long as there's no harm being shown, a lot of women will try things and, and personally I'm okay with that. So I think um, whether it makes a difference or not is, is a little bit difficult to answer. Um, so I think maybe if you want to try it, I, I'd go ahead and try. I don't think you'll do any harm by being on the royal jelly. Okay. Um, now Lauren's asking, do we have weight restrictions on starting IVF? Um, look, as a, as a clinic, we don't have weight restrictions. Um, but generally speaking, pregnancy is often hard on the body. Um, it's like having a stress test on your body. And, and so being in the most optimum sort of condition before you start to get pregnant is probably best, um, in terms of you then carrying the baby and having a healthy baby at the end and a healthy mother at the end of the pregnancy. So ideally, um, we talk about BMI, which is body mass index, which is which takes into account someone's height um, as well as their weight. And ideally, you want to be less than 35, your BMI less than 35 um, when you're doing IVF. There's no rules per se, like there's no law that says that you have to um, be under that in order to do IVF. But just generally speaking, um, it is good practice to try and um, make uh, make your body be in the most optimum sort of condition possible um, before you try and get pregnant. I know it's hard though. Um, it's really easy for people to sit here and tell you to lose weight, you know. Um, I know it's hard. Um, and it often takes a long time as well to lose weight and sometimes, you know, you're either frustrated because you've already been trying for so long um, to get pregnant, you know, or um, you don't have time because we've got a low reserve or because of age um, you don't have time to try and lose all that weight so I know it's really difficult um, it's a difficult conversation to have as well but generally speaking trying to be as fit as possible before you get pregnant is a good a good thing but there's no sort of weight restrictions per se uh, Jessica McDonald um, so at the age of 36 with an AMH of 2.3 can I afford to wait another year or two okay um, so the AMH is a blood test 
It stands for anti-malarian hormone. And it's a blood test that looks at this hormone because this hormone is released by the eggs in the ovaries. Yeah. So if someone has lots of eggs in the ovaries and the hormone level is really high. Yeah. If someone's used all their eggs up, so not many eggs in the ovaries, nothing make the hormone. So hormone levels come back low. And we've got graphs. Um, because we know at each age from 24 onwards how much hormone should be in the system, okay? And at 36, um, that AMH level, it is low. Um, and I think um, it doesn't say anything about egg quality, and Jessica's still young, you know, so the quality of the eggs should be quite good. It's just that the, the, the reserve is low, so she doesn't have very many eggs. And I think... Um, you'd need an ultrasound scan to further look at things like there's other tests that you need to do as well but i think the general um advice would be that um you'd want to try and um, have a family sooner rather than later with that result um because the problem with the eggs is we're born with all of the eggs already in the ovaries and we just use them up as we get older so guys will make sperm we don't know how to make eggs and so when we finish our eggs that's it we can't make new ones um and it's then really difficult to try and get pregnant so um i think that you know the, the other things i obviously don't know how many children you want to have um but what it's saying is that there's a time there's a bit of a time pressure there to particularly if you might want to have more than one child you know because if you have a child now or you wait two years and have a child will you then be able to have another one after that because the egg count continues to drop with time so i think all of those things need to be taken into consideration but just the question at face value i would say at 36 with a low egg reserve i'd probably be talking to a fertility with someone a doctor about um, getting other tests done and evaluating what your body's up to, to then come up with a decision about whether whether you should whether you can wait another year or two. Um, you know, it's hard as well. Some people can't afford to drop everything and get pregnant now. You know, because you're doing other things. You're working. There's other stuff going on, so it's difficult. But you know, I do I do see other women in this in a similar situation every week, um, and they do like some women are are able to readjust their their um, situation um, and make it a priority and actually start trying and often you will get pregnant naturally it's not like you need to do IVF or anything because you're still quite young so I think just maybe get some more tests done and just get a, a bigger picture um, view on what's going on to maybe help you make your decision Jessica okay um, Camilla um, is there any strong conclusive research that bariatric surgery can reduce the success of IVF. Um, I don't think that there that there's evidence that bariatric surgery can reduce the success of IVF. Um, if anything, it could improve the success of IVF because women will lose weight. So we know that um, if you're really overweight, it, it will imp it can impact on your pregnancy chance. It can also impact on your miscarriage chance. Yeah, um, and some women, no matter how hard they try it's really difficult to lose the weight. And a bariatric surgery, which is where you have an operation to either um, make the stomach smaller or, or reroute things, or there's various different types of surgery options. Um, and what that does is it, it may, means that because you can't eat as much, you then lose the weight. Um, and losing the weight will then increase your chance of pregnancy and reduce your chance of miscarriage. So I think that bariatric surgery in the right patient can actually improve the chances rather than reduce the chances of getting pregnant with IVF, if that makes sense. Um, Rainbow. Um, okay, so Rainbow's asking if we can have sex whilst on stimulation cycle. Um, the answer is you can, but as the woman grows more eggs in the ovaries the ovaries become physically quite big um, because there's lots of follicles in there yeah every month you normally grow one follicle you don't feel anything yeah but with IVF you're trying to get eight or nine follicles to grow so ovaries are physically big yeah so lots of women will find they're really uncomfortable and they don't actually want to have sex um, because they're yeah they're, they are uncomfortable and bloated um, so I think the answer to that is yes you can but um, as you get more uncomfortable you probably won't feel like doing it anyway but also the other side of things is that we also when we take the eggs out want a sample from your partner so um, it's not good if he's um, ejaculated the night before the egg collection so um, just need to have a chat to your to your nurses um, and your doctor about timing of, of things there um, Violet why would my doctor talk about 
the possibility of a day three transfer rather than day five transfer. Okay, so why we grow embryos for five days is because you're trying to weed out the ones that aren't going to make you pregnant. Yeah, so just theoretically speaking, if we start out with 10 eggs, normally fertilization is normally about 70%. Yeah, so from the 10 eggs, maybe we get seven fertilized eggs. And then as we grow the embryos along, you're gonna find that some embryos, they don't have enough energy in them and they stop growing, yeah? So on day three, you might have four embryos that still look good. On day five, you might have one or two embryos that still look good, okay? So there's a natural kind of attrition as you grow the embryos along for the five days. And ideally you're getting to five days because then you've kind of weeded out the ones that aren't gonna get you there. Um, so you get pregnant faster. Yeah. Now, prior to when we figured out how to grow embryos to five days, we were putting embryos back on day three. Okay. Now, eventually you'll get the embryo back anyway, the one that would have eventually gone to day five. It just takes you longer because you've got more embryos on day three. So when we figured out how to grow embryos to day five, that's why everyone went to growing embryos to day five, because the whole aim of this is to get help people get pregnant as quickly as possible, not drag this out for our patients. Um, now, the problem with this is some embryos, they don't make it. Um, to day five, which um, was another question earlier um, that I was talking about. Some embryos, they run out of steam and they get to go really nicely to day three and then they stop between day three and day five. Um, now, there is a school of thought that if you've got an embryo on day three and there's not a lot of embryos, either so maybe there's one embryo on day three is there any point in trying to grow it an extra two days in the lab because if you put it back it'll grow just as nicely in the woman as it would in the lab so one reason why doctors will talk about putting an embryo back early on day three would be because there's not a lot of embryos there anyway yeah so going to day five is because you're trying to um, eliminate the ones that stop growing between day three and five so you can hone in on the ones that are going to get you pregnant but with fewer embryos on day three there's, there's an argument that there's actually no point trying to grow extra two days in the lab when the woman's more physiologically normal um, and able to grow the embryo herself so that's one reason why people will put embryo doctors will suggest that you have embryos put back on day three the other reason would be because some embryos they don't grow well in the lab between day three and day five and so that's sometimes another reason why doctors will say, look, we can't get any of your embryos to day five, so maybe we'll put them back earlier so that you've got a chance of getting pregnant. You know, because the problem is if the embryos don't grow to, a, to the right stage on day five and you don't get a transfer, so you don't get an embryo put back in, then your chance of pregnancy from that cycle is a big fat zero. Yeah. Whereas if you put an embryo back in day three, sure, the chance is lower than a day five because you haven't worked out whether it's actually going to make it to day five or not, but at least you then got a chance of pregnancy. So that's again, sometimes why doctors will suggest putting embryos back on day three. Um, Lou, if I have an unsuccessful cycle, what happens next? Um, so if you have an unsuccessful cycle, the job of your doctor is actually to work out why it hasn't worked. Yeah, so you shouldn't, um, so you should actually be talking to your doctor after your unsuccessful cycle. And I certainly, a lot of, a lot of my colleagues as well, will, will speak to our patients after a cycle hasn't worked because our job is actually to try and work out what went wrong and what we have to fiddle with to try and get it to work. IVF is not doing the same thing three times in a row and then going, oh, it hasn't worked, what are we going to do? Like that's not what IVF is, right? Because the first IVF cycle that you do Whilst it's trying to get you pregnant, just purely based on statistics, you've got more eggs to try with, therefore a higher chance of pregnancy. But that first cycle of IVF, often it also tells you why you're not getting pregnant. Because up until that point, everything that's happening inside the woman's body, we can't see it. Yeah, we know that they're releasing eggs, we know that there's enough sperm there, we know that the fallopian tubes are working, but we can't see quality of eggs, we can't see how the eggs and sperm actually get together and interact together, we can't see what kind of embryos couples are making, all of that information you don't get until you actually do the IVF cycle and you can see it in front of you. And then you can kind of try and piece together why this couple isn't getting pregnant. Um, so I think if your first cycle doesn't work, you need to really have a chat to your doctor about dissecting out your cycle and trying to figure out what bits didn't work and what they can, what your doctor can do to try and make it better so that you do get pregnant the next, next cycle. And sometimes it means tweaking medication. So yes, you can get going again next month. Sometimes no, there's other things you need to do. So I can't answer that question. I think if you have an unsuccessful cycle, really the next thing to do is talk to your doctor about why it hasn't worked and then work out a plan with that doctor. Okay, um, Katie, is an AMH level of eight low? Um, really depends on your age. 
here. So um, I don't have a picture of the graph here, but if you guys Google AMH normogram, you'll see that there's a graph that we often refer to where there's age along the bottom of the graph and the AMH level on the other axis. And you can see that the AMH level it drops with age because that's naturally what's going to happen here. Yeah? And then you can look up your age, you look up the level of um, hormone, and then you can see whether that's normal for your age or whether you're low for your age. It's, it's hard to answer that question. I'm sorry, Katie, because I need an age to kind of try and gauge for you. Okay. Um, Emily, um, I've been advised to take NMN to improve egg quality. Can you tell me about this? So um, NMN is a precursor um, to um, try and improve the DNA um, and um, energy levels in the egg. Um, studies are quite preliminary. A lot of the studies are on animals as opposed to humans. Um, it's, it's really difficult to do studies on human eggs, um, as you can imagine. Um, so a lot of the studies tend to be done on animals first, and then you try and, and translate it to, to humans. Um, so at the moment, there are some, some promising animal studies, um, but um, not a lot in humans so far. So I think, um, again, there's not been any evidence of any harm, which is why some people will want to try it. Um, but the studies are also a little bit inconclusive about how well, it's, how well it works. Um, rainbow AMH for age 36 is 35. Um, okay, so Rainbow's got a very good um, reserve um, for her age. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it is high. I don't know that it's too high, which is what her question is. Um, does, does that AMH level seem too high? I think that um, it, it's a good thing to have lots of eggs because it means that your chances of getting pregnant um, with IVF are actually higher because you can imagine the more eggs you get, the better the chance of finding the one that's going to give you the baby, right? If you did an IVF cycle and all we could get was four eggs each time you did IVF, your chances are not going to be as good as if we could do IVF and get 12 eggs out um, with one try. So um, I think that it, I think it's a good thing that your AMH is that level, Rainbow. Um, I don't think it's too high. I think it's a good thing. But your doctor does have to manage things carefully because with high AMH, um, there, there is also a risk of getting too many eggs and overstimulating um, the patient, which we talked about right at the beginning of this um, Facebook Live session. We talked about how if you overstimulate, the woman can get quite sick and unwell from that process. So your doctor does have to be careful with that, Rainbow. So just... Um, but it's not a bad thing to have a good AMH level. Um, yeah, except Camilla agrees that it's a good thing, Rainbow, to have a to have a good AMH result. Um, okay, so um, what happens when the sperm count is low? Um, okay, so when the sperm count is low, the job of your fertility doctor is to work out why it's low. Yeah, so it's not it's not enough to go, oh, you've got a low sperm count, therefore just do insemination or just do IVF. You've got to try and work out why it's like that. And that's going to involve um, probably a repeat sample for your partner. It's going to involve blood tests, perhaps an ultrasound scan for your partner. There's things we need to do to try and work out um, what um, why it's like that. Sometimes um, low sperm counts can reflect what's going on in the guy's general health. Um, so you just want to make sure that that there's nothing else um, that it's a marker for. Yeah, if there's nothing else that can be found and the sperm count really is low, then there's normally a couple of different options. In order to get pregnant naturally, we know that we need at least five million good quality sperm. So moving normal looking sperm in the vagina in order for you to have a decent chance of getting pregnant that month. Because if you think about how far the distance is from the vagina up to the fallopian tube and how little the sperm is, you need so many sperm in the vagina in order to get a few up to the egg. Okay. If the sperm counts a little bit borderline, sometimes we can do insemination. Yeah. So what that would be is um, with the sperm sample, we get rid of the sperm that don't look normal, take away the sperm that don't move properly. So we've just got the sperm that's going to get you guys pregnant. Um, and provided we've got at least 2 million good quality sperm, then what we do is at the right time of the month, we put the sperm up inside the uterus, which is just like having a pap smear done. But that now places the sperm and eggs right next to each other. Yeah. And so it shortens the distance that the sperm have to go to get around the number um, issue. Yeah. 
If we don't have 2 million sperm though, then insemination, you don't have a good chance of getting pregnant with insemination. Um, so then your option is IVF. And IVF, you've got an egg, you're going to put 50,000 sperm on top of the egg and let whichever sperm gets in, that's the one that wins. Okay. And if you don't have enough for that, then we can do ICSI, which is where we have an egg, we physically go choose a sperm and put the sperm into the egg. So now for one egg, you only need one sperm. Yeah, so for varying degrees of low sperm count, there are all the different treatment options. And I think your doctor needs to try and look at um, what's going on there, firstly, for your partner, and then secondly, assessing how low is low to see what kind of options you've got available. Okay, um, Kate's asking why the success rates of IVF are better in other countries um, other than Australia. Um, Okay, I think success rates are an interesting question. Um, and a lot of the time you've got to look at what people are reporting. Um, sometimes what happens is, I mean, ideally what you're looking at is the live birth rate. Um, and what we tend to report here is the pregnancy rates per embryo transfer. Okay, um, you also have to take into account the age of the woman because pregnancy rates are very much related to women's age. Um, we haven't really been able to get around that. Um, and that's probably because, as I said, like the eggs, we're born with them. And so eggs that have been in the body for 40 years are not as nice as eggs that have been in the body for 30 years. And so we know that as the age goes up, the pregnancy chance goes down because the quality of the eggs isn't as good. Um, and IVF hasn't, re I mean, getting pregnant with IVF, the chance of pregnancy is still higher than a natural conception um, up to a certain age. And then there's no real advantage to doing IVF anymore. The pregnancy chances are actually very similar. But um, doing IVF, often the pregnancy rate is higher than a natural conception rate, just because you can get more eggs um, to deal with. Um, looking at other countries, um, you've just got to make sure you're comparing like for like. A lot of countries overseas will put in more than one embryo. Um, so the pregnancy rate is going to be slightly higher. The studies show that it doesn't double the pregnancy chance if you put two embryos back in, but what it does do is it increases the um, chance of having twins and triplets and quadruplets, which is not a good thing because for humans, we're only meant to really have one baby at a time. And so we find with twins and triplets, they invariably come early. Um, and being premature also then carries risks of having learning disabilities and other issues for the children. So that's why in Australia, we're really strict with only putting one embryo back in each time. And our twin rate, our multiple pregnancy rate, therefore, is quite low. It sits at about 7%. Whereas if you look in the US, um, their twin rate's up around 30%. And when we go to conferences, like international conferences, they very much want to have the same twin rate or multiple pregnancy rate that we have, but they just can't do it because the way that their healthcare system is set up, they're putting back three or four embryos each, multiple embryos each time. So you just have to... Um, see how many embryo like what the baseline is when you're comparing the pregnancy rates um spain also has a lot and i'm not saying that this is the reason why their pregnancy rates are high but just be careful that spain also use a lot of donor eggs so um they have a very big donor egg program over there um which is different to here here women can struggle to find donor eggs so they may be in their 40s um but they um and, and so it's very difficult to get pregnant with their own eggs and so if you were to find eggs from a younger woman, then the chance of pregnancy would become better because the egg quality is better. Um, and in Australia, because we're not allowed to pay women for their eggs and women have to do an IVF cycle um, with all the injections and the procedure to take the eggs, that's a lot to ask of someone if they're not going to get any compensation for it. So there's not a lot of egg donors, no women, line of women like going out the door trying to donate their eggs, you know. And whereas in Spain, they're paid for their eggs. And so there's quite a big... Um, market for donor eggs there so you just also have to look at what that, that they do that they're reporting pregnancy rates based on the woman's age um rather than with donor eggs because that will be better than if you looked at pregnancy rates um given a particular age um mandy's asking one embryo transfer versus two embryo transfers um so mandy's 44 with pcos Am I better doing one or two? We've done two in the past with several fails. We had one double transfer result in a pregnancy but ended in termination due to issues. I'm sorry, Mandy. Um, look, I think that's a tough one. It's probably one to discuss with your fertility specialist. Um, 
the issue is at 44, whilst you've got PCOS, it's a good thing because PCOS means that you've got plenty of eggs in the ovaries. And when you look at women who do get pregnant in their 40s doing IVF, it's always women who create a lot of eggs um, because then you've got a really good chance that at least one of those eggs is going to be good. Okay. Um, the main issue, though, is still the quality of those eggs. And we know that as we get into our 40s, the chance of miscarriage goes up, often because there's something wrong with the embryo. Like it's, we know the chances of Down syndrome, those sorts of things go up with age. Um, and so the chances of miscarriage therefore go up as well. And the chances of embryos not taking will go up because if there's something chromosomally wrong, it's got too many chromosomes or missing chromosomes, it's not going to take when you put the embryo back in, even though it looks beautiful under the microscope. So I think that... Um, it's it's diff it's a difficult question to answer without knowing exactly what's happened in your history, but it's probably worth having a chat to your fertility specialist about. We know that putting two embryos back in, it doesn't double your chance of getting pregnant. It might go up a little bit. Um, it does complicate the pregnancy, though, if, if both of them do take um, and one of them isn't normal and the other one is. The outlook for that one normal um, baby then it's not as good as if it just started out being one embryo that was put back in so it, it does complicate things putting two embryos back in but I guess you're also balancing that up with what are the chances that the embryo is normal the time the financial investment in IVF the emotional investment in IVF you know so all of these things you've got to weigh up whenever you do anything start a medication do a procedure you're weighing up what benefit you're going to get from doing something versus the risks and costs of doing it you know, and if you and your fertility specialist decide that putting two embryos back in, the benefits outweigh the risks, then I think that's something that you should do. But it's probably worth having that discussion with your specialist who actually knows you. Um, Kath is asking, um, how many days should my husband abstain for prior to andrology? So if it's, a, if it's just a semen analysis that your husband's doing, um, normally we would say two, three days beforehand to abstain. Okay, it's not actually good to try and store it all up for a week and then show us what he has because the sperm quality won't be very good. Okay, so maybe two, three days beforehand would be good. Um, and Ella's asking, what is the process of ovulation stimulation? My cycles seem to be different every month. Um, I'm not sure if you're referring to um, IVF or whether you're referring to ovulation induction um, to try and ovulate. So ovulation induction is what's done when girls have very irregular periods. Um, and this may be due to PCOS, it may be due to other conditions um, where they have um, irregular periods. And the periods are irregular because they're actually not releasing eggs properly. Um, and so rather than going straight to IVF for those women, often what we'll try and do is try and fix the hormone imbalance to try and get them to ovulate. And then if we do blood tests and ultrasound, sounds then we know when the egg's going to come out and we'll be like have sex now and then we see if we can get pregnant that way and we can either use tablets to do that so tablets called letrozole or we can use injections to do that um, so there's a couple of different ways to try and get the ovaries to work and stimulate the ovaries to work and often it is different every month when you try because you've got a different bunch of eggs there the ovaries will respond differently so that's why whenever you do this kind of treatment um, to get the ovaries to ovulate so that you can have sex to get pregnant, you need to have monitoring. You need blood tests and ultrasounds each cycle because it will be different each cycle when you try. Um, and then Kate um, is asking, do you recommend PGS, PGD testing? So what? Um, so that's pre-implantation genetic screening. Um, and what that is is um, when we do the IVF process and we've taken the eggs out, put the eggs and sperm together, create the embryos. We then grow the embryos for five days. And on the five days, you then have the bunch of embryos that actually can create, um, have the chance of creating a pregnancy. Um, and in that scenario, what, what we would then do is make a hole in the embryo, take four or five cells out of the embryo, and then we freeze the embryo. And the aim of doing that is to analyze the chromosome makeup of that embryo. Because when you put an embryo back in to someone, it needs to continue to grow and divide for you, which comes down to one of two things. One is whether it has enough energy to grow and divide, um, and the other is the genetics of the embryo, yeah? Because embryos can look beautiful under a microscope, but it could be missing a chromosome or have an additional chromosome, like a Down syndrome baby. It's not gonna give you a healthy child, yeah? So doing the screening for the genetics means that you've kind of eliminated one of those variables in terms of whether this embryo is gonna get you pregnant or not. Um, so again, like I said before, whenever you do anything, 
you're trying to weigh up the benefits and risks, which sounds weird because I'm an IVF doctor. I think there's a lot of intervention. There's a lot of um, technology out there. It doesn't mean that it applies to everyone. Um, I think people where um, the pre-implantation screening might be useful would be if we know that there's a chromosome issue in the patient in, in one of the patients, because then we know that they're at a higher chance of making embryos that aren't normal. Um, and so in that scenario, it would be useful to know which ones are normal so we can get pregnant um, quicker. Uh, another scenario where screening might be useful might be in someone who keeps miscarrying um, over and over. Um, having eliminated all the other causes potentially for miscarriage and with, we're down to the embryos not being normal, that's why we're miscarrying. So the theory behind that is therefore if we put back a normal embryo, then the chance of miscarriage will drop. The third scenario where screening can be quite good would be if um, we had lots of embryos. Yeah, so it's used as a tool to decide which embryo to put back first. You know, so some girls, particularly the polycystic ovary, ovarian syndrome type girls, they and young, they can create six, seven beautiful blastocysts. And you then have no idea which one goes back in first because they can look quite similar under a microscope, even though inside the embryo they're not quite right. So that's another scenario where perhaps screening the embryos could be useful because if you've got seven embryos there and three are normal and four aren't, well, then you'd go straight for the normal ones to try and get pregnant faster. Yep. Um, there was a big study that was done hmm, last year um, out of the States, and they looked at screening embryos. Um, and the um, study came back saying that if you were young, if you were a young woman, young being under 37 years of age, then there's actually no advantage to screening the embryos because a lot of the embryos would be normal. Whereas in women who are over 38, um, perhaps screening could play a role. The flip side of that though, is the embryos have to be very good quality in order for us to screen the embryos. And sometimes women in their 40s don't create us embryos like that. So it's very difficult to recommend screening in your very first IVF try because you don't actually know what the couple's going to do. Um, so unless you, unless you know that there's some kind of chromosome issue you're looking for, you know at the start that there's going to be something you're looking for often with the first try we try um, because you also don't want to do any harm. Yeah, and it, it is, you would think, quite traumatic to the embryo to make a hole in it and then take four or five cells out of it, then freeze it, then ask it to survive a defrosting and continue to grow when you put it back in, you know. So you, you've got to weigh the screening up against potential harm to the embryo as well to try and balance up whether it's the best thing for you to do. Um, I am probably running out of time. Um, Melissa, day three or day five transfers is one better than the other. Probably, I, I did speak about this a bit earlier um, in the segment. Um, I'm really sorry. I'll, I'm just going to skip over that. Um, if you play it back, you'll probably hear the answer to that question. Um, Rainbow's asking if we have an app to see the embryos growing. We don't um, have an app. Um, but our scientists, because we use embryoscopes, um, so that means that when we put the embryo back in, the um, the incubator will take photos of the um, snapshots of the embryos. And so um, we can then get a video reel of what the embryo's done over the five days of growth. And so some patients will ask for, we'll bring in a little um, USB stick um, and on the day of the transfer and we'll put that embryo's um, growth onto the USB stick for you. So just ask your ask your um, doctor at the time if you transfer. Um, does embryo glue improve implantation? Um, there are studies out there that show that it does. I personally will um, use embryo glue for all of my um, embryo transfers now. A lot of my colleagues do as well. Um, and it's not really glue. What it is, it's a compound that we coat the embryo with before we put the embryo back in and just um, makes the communication between the embryo and the lining of the uterus a little bit easier is how it works. Um, so it depends on your doctor, I think, as to whether they'll suggest that that's what you have or not. Um, uh, okay. I think that I'm going to have to, uh, this will be your last question. Hey, Michaela. Um, our selected donor came back with two gene mutations. We've had a blood test and we're waiting on the results. What are the chances we won't be compatible? Look, I think those two gene mutations are really rare. They're really rare. And so I think that um, if, I think the chances that you're gonna have the same two gene mutations are actually really small. 
Okay, so um, wait for the result. I think don't don't um, don't worry. Uh, I think I think you'll be okay, but we'll wait for the result and see. Okay, um, and so why why we're doing that is because a lot of our um, a lot of our donors we will run a gene panel on them so that we a lot of these genes you don't necessarily know are running through your families because in order for the gene to come out the child must have inherited two faulty copies of a particular gene so one would have come from mum one from dad yep and as a carrier you don't know because you've got this gene but you've also got a normal gene so families don't know the genes in the family until two carriers come together then there's a one in four chance you then produce a child with the condition um, and so what Michaela is saying is that um, their sperm donor has come back with two particular gene mutations which I think are very rare mutations like not a lot of the uh, not a lot of people will carry this gene and so I think the chances that Michaela will also carry the gene is going to be very small and so if the donor has the gene but Michaela doesn't then the child's not going to have the condition won't won't have a chance of having the condition so that's why Michaela's being checked for that too okay I'm really sorry everyone I know um, that um, there's still a couple of questions um, here but um, it's uh, yeah I, I think we're gonna have to end the session thank you very much for watching and um, I'll try and get to the questions um, as well um, so that I, I will answer you um, Alicia and um, Kerry I think were the two questions that I haven't been able to get to I will answer you um, after the session okay thanks so much for joining me um, oh and my daughter made these so join us follow on Instagram okay all right good luck everyone and I'll talk to you later bye